It's okay to be anxious in front of your kids, but when you model the way you don't want them acting, they are learning the way you don't want them acting. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. I am your host, Joanne Crown, joined here by the lovely Brie Tucker. Why, hello, hello, everybody. How are you? We are doing something very close to my heart today because we're interviewing a two-timer guest, Regine Galanti. She has a new book out called Parenting Anxious Kids. And I was an anxious kid. And I think it's so important for parents to know this information just to help kids through life and develop those skills. Yep. I say like I was an anxious kid. I am an anxious adult and I'm a parent of anxious kids. So, you know, hands up in the air if you think y'all can relate. (laughs) Yeah. So really, really pay attention to this episode because we're going to go through the ways that parents make anxieties worse in kids and what to do instead. And it is no shame here. Bree and I totally cop to doing these things ourselves. Mm -hmm. So Regine Galanti, she's the founder of Long Island Behavioral Psychology, a private practice in New York and author of Parenting Anxious Kids. She specializes in helping kids, teens, and parents manage anxiety through cognitive behavioral therapy and specifically giving them tools to help them face their fears. We hope you enjoy our interview with Regine. You want mom life to be easier. That's our goal too. Our mission is to raise more self-sufficient and independent kids, and we're going to have fun doing it. We're going to help you delegate and step back. Each episode, we'll tackle strategies for positive discipline, making our kids more responsible and making our lives better in the process. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. Welcome back to the podcast, Regine. We are so excited to have you, especially because your new book comes out today, Parenting Anxious Kids. So welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You know, I, I see, I see, I was going to say, I'm always excited to have a two-timer on the show. I got it. I got it. We got to get her. We yeah. got to get her club jackets. We got to get her club, jackets. club jackets. Oh, can I get a jacket jacket for being a two-timer? Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Like, I'm a two-timer <laughs> yes. with the No Guilt Mom podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's an imaginary jacket. <laughs> we'll send you your imaginary jacket uh, in the mail. You. I'll take it. <laughs> and you could imaginarily receive it and put have it on. Have it right now. <laughs> So yeah, you have it right now. Exactly. Wearing it right now. I see on the the wall behind you, your book, Anxiety Relief really for Teens. And like, I was just talking with my daughter about you because that's how we initially found you. She was dealing with some anxiety issues and I found your book on Amazon and I'm like, I should just contact her. And here you are. And you've been in part of like our summits and interviews. Yeah. And I'm so happy that that happened. <laughs> Me too. And this book you've written, Parenting Anxious Kids, is so needed because in our balance community in particular, parents are dealing with this a lot. And I don't know what you've seen, but have you seen a rise in anxiety, especially since the pandemic in your practice? Yes. (laughs) That's the short answer. But I think that my practice was very full, even pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic mm-hmm. hit, and it was just like, like the, I, there's no way me or anyone I know can keep up with the demand. Yeah. When I was reading your book, something struck me like that it's not necessarily that there's more anxiety happening in the world, but people are figuring out that they might be dealing with anxiety or may have had undiagnosed anxiety before. Mm-hmm. And I thought back to like when I was a kid, I definitely had the undiagnosed anxiety as a child that is now diagnosed in my adult life. And I know like strategies to deal with. But if I had known it as a child, I always think like, how would my life have been different? How much less fear would I have had in elementary school, like in social situations? Or how much more would I have put myself out there if I had known that, hey, these feelings I have, other people have them too. And there's a way to get through them. Well, I think, hold on, I got to throw in there too. I, having a child that has anxiety right now too, I am having, that is a huge mic drop right there. Because getting them to understand that they are normal doesn't have to be normal. That there is a, is a less stressful normal out there that they could get to. And right. we could just work with this anxiety. Right. Oh, that's so heartbreaking though, Joanne. Like I, I think that's kind of why I wrote this book because 
anxiety is everywhere and it doesn't have to be this terrible thing that kind of like, don't look at the monster, like hiding under your bed. We can face it and learn strategies to deal with it. And we can do that on a bunch of different levels. It doesn't always have to be, hey, wait till your kid is old enough and let them handle it. There are things that as parents, we can do to help our kids be more successful. Because something that you touched on, which I think is really important for everyone to know, is that not all anxiety is bad. Can you tell us a little bit more about why we need anxiety in some right. form? Well, the short answer is we need anxiety so we don't die, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to look both ways before you cross the street. That is a little bit anxiety. Like you're afraid of getting hit by cars. So you look both ways so you don't get hit by cars. That is good. So much like anxiety is a smoke detector. And we have smoke detectors in our homes to tell us that there is a fire, right? So anxiety keeps us alive. Almost like if you imagine a caveman that's like a chill surfer dude or like super chill about issues. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I don't know why suddenly I could totally picture a caveman on a surfer. Right. <laughs> caveman why. on a beach. But that... <laughs> and Sino man is what I'm picturing. <laughs> Has a little medicinal plants by the right. cave. Like... <laughs> but that, that, that guy's going to try to pet the tiger when it comes around, right? Yeah. <laughs> and bad things happen true. when you pet the tiger. So anxiety. Like that, don't pet the tiger. Don't pet the don't tiger. Don't pet the tiger. <laughs> Just don't. Right. So that's anxiety that tells you don't pet the tiger. That's a good thing, except when it's not a tiger and it's public speaking or like, you know, doing your homework. Then that's not a tiger. Yeah. But your brain's like, hey, tiger, let's let's not take this risk. Ordering a drink. <laughs> Ordering your drive through <laughs> Starbucks. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's a therapeutic goal in our household to be able to order her drink at Starbucks. <laughs> But that's a good one, right? Because it's also like yeah. values driven, right? What teenager doesn't mm -hmm. want a Starbucks drink? So if it's like right. order it or don't get it, oh, okay, mom. Exactly. And specifically what you do to help kids with anxiety is you use a type of therapy called CBT. Can you explain that right. a little bit? So what I do is cognitive behavioral therapy and I'm mostly like on the behavior side. So it's a short-term, very symptom-focused approach to anxiety, where my goal is basically to have kids do things that make them uncomfortable, things that they want to do that they're not doing because their anxiety is saying, don't do that, that's scary. Don't text your friend. Your friend doesn't want to hear from you. You probably don't even have friends, but we know objectively. <laughs> that, I hear that in my right. house a lot. <laughs> that's why I laugh. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, just because you're a therapist doesn't mean that your kids don't have anxiety also. So you could be doing mostly everything right and still fall into these same patterns, which is a tough one. Mental health does not discriminate. <laughs> no. And I, and I like how you break it apart, how CBT breaks apart anxiety into those three different parts, how it's your thoughts, your physical reactions, and your behaviors. Because I never thought of it that way. And seeing it in terms of a triangle and if you break one part of the triangle, you actually help the anxiety. Right. It's almost like it's a cycle, right? So they're all spiraling on themselves. That's not really a thing that things do, but I'll go with it. So you have these thoughts of danger, but then you also have your body just fight or flight. One thing I notice parents do a lot, yeah. right, is like, it's okay. You know, it's not real. So you can just do it. But your body is giving you a different message. Your body's saying like, whoa, no, my heart's beating right. fast. I'm sweating. Like my brain might be saying this is okay, but my body's like, nope, not okay. Right. Okay. It's hard to ignore the body. Yes. That's a hard one. Right. And we teach kids not to. Yeah, because your body sees it. <laughs> right. And you even choose not right. to. Right. So yeah. when yeah. do I pay attention to my body and when do I not? It's kind of a therapy right? goal. It gets you into like this weird area because what anxiety did, at least to me, is that it led me to this distrust of my bodily symptoms because all these adults around me were saying, hey, like, it's no big deal. But my body was like, oh, heart beating fast, like neck muscles and shoulder muscles all clenched. And it led me not to trust my body and not to trust what my body's saying. And I think a lot of people get into that situation. Right. And that's so hard because your body is giving you accurate information about how it feels. It's just mm -hmm. that feeling is not what you want to be doing, right? 
you're feeling all tight and tense because let's say, I don't know, you have to speak in front of a crowd and that's going to make you want to not speak, but speaking is something you want to do. So it's- Or have to do, right? right? Let's just be honest. Right, right. So you have to be able to take that information and say, oh, my body is saying I am in danger. But I know that that's incorrect. So I'm going to have to make a different decision based on the cues that I have available to me, like the whole picture. Yeah, which is so interesting. And I know like you have ways that parents can help with this and things that they do to hurt with this. And we are going to get into these things that parents may be doing that do not help kids with anxiety right after this break. It's 2024 and I have a very big goal this year. I am going to get our budget to a happy place. And that is why I am really excited about starting this year by using EveryPlate. Their meals are cheaper than your average takeout. And I am going to ditch my weekly takeout and I'm going to save some money. All while still enjoying some really yummy meals that I can make at home. Yeah, I'm excited to try Every Plate too because not only do they make the meal times easier, they have a focus on quality as well, which is so important to me when I'm cooking. And they have sustainably sourced seafood that meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood ranking. So you know that your meals are going to be fresh and flavorful. And I cannot wait to try it. And the best thing is they plan the meals, they deliver the pre portioned ingredients right to your door so you can spend less time meal prepping and more time like you Brie reaching your new year's goals I know and I'm also excited about this one check it out my daughter is going to love it you can add steak to your weekly meal plan like a 10 ounce ranch steak for just a dollar a box when you have a subscription so I can't I just can't we're gonna be having a great time that's that's a pretty good steak deal that (laughs) is Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal plus $1 steaks for life. Oh my gosh, your daughter's going to be so excited by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49NGM. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steak. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. So we recently got our youngest a Greenlight card, and I have to tell you, it's been amazing. Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families that gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy, while also giving parents some peace of mind. Like you can send instant money transfers, automate allowance, and even keep an eye on kids spending with real-time notifications. For us, the best part has just been seeing how my son has felt so empowered with like a card of his own that he could spend things on. He feels more grown up and has more responsibility. And as a baby of the family, you gotta have that feeling. So join me and 6 million other parents and kids who are learning about money on Greenlight. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash NGM. That's greenlight.com slash NGM to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash NGM. NGM. So Regine, in your book, you tell this story about your daughter and a hairdryer in the public restroom. Can you share that story with us? Right. So this was my youngest who's now six and thankfully outgrown this, but I shouldn't say outgrown this because I think we worked on it. Used to freak out in public restrooms, like freak out because there was the loud dryer and those things are super loud. So she Mm -hmm. would just not want to go to the bathroom. Like she'd be like, hey, can we go home? We'd be in Trader Joe's and she'd have to go to the bathroom. And she'd be like, we need to go home right now. Like I have to go to the bathroom. So we need to go home. We cannot use this bathroom. Yeah. Right. And as a parent, you're very torn because you're like, I don't want to make my kids suffer. And also I don't want to leave my cart full of groceries in the middle of the grocery store and give into this. And even as a psychologist, it's hard to know what the right answer is because emotions take over, right? Like emotions are like, oh, I have to protect my kid. I have to save her from this anxiety. But again, like therapist hat on, we can't let this be a thing that my kid is never going to be a kid who goes to a public restroom. Like we don't do that. We do hard things in my family, but it doesn't have to be like shove you into the bathroom, close the door and like turn on the dry the the dryer and let's see what happens because that's kind of mean that'd be a little traumatic yeah we don't want to do that either so it was more like uh, we took steps so sometimes I started bringing headphones with me to public places so she could put them over her ears so it would dull the sound 
and still she needed the encouragement. Like sometimes I'd, I'd bring stickers also, like give her a sticker after she went to the bathroom, even though she'd still be freaking out. But it dulled the sound enough that she was able to use the bathroom and then a lot of encouragement and a lot of like praise for, hey, you did the hard thing. I'm so proud of you. And yeah. now she is a successful public restroom user. So. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be a badge for that, an award. <laughs> With the, There's like a lot of like anxieties around public restrooms though. Um, the flushing, automatic flushing toilets, I know was like a big anxiety among a lot of kids. Oh, still is. My daughter it, was growing up. Someone who recently ran preschools, still is. <laughs> still is. Post it. No, you get into post it. So the official like helper of all preschool programs that have self flushing <laughs> toilets, right? Cover the sensor because also it's not even fair. The kids are too like I know, know they don't weigh enough. To... <laughs> Poor kids. Oh goodness gracious! Anyway. Easily suck down that toilet when it's flushed. <laughs> like I mean, as a little kid, that would be terrifying. I remember being scared of being on the toilet as a little kid and it flushing. It's like, I couldn't even imagine if it was an automatic thing that like you had no control over. But I think that's a good thing to help people kind of relate to this situation because that is a very well-known, very common fear of kids, especially when they're potty training, of a toilet flushing. And it's not always just the, I'm afraid I'm going to fall down the toilet and get flushed away. It's like, it's the noise, it's the sound, it's the water spraying, it's all that stuff. And we think about how we help support them moving through that and it just kind of like, it just, to me, it kind of just shows how it doesn't seem that unusual now to hear, Regine, your story about your daughter having issues with the sounds. I mean, that's, that doesn't seem that out of left field yet. A lot of us still have that first thought of like, well, you just got to do it. Let's just yeah, deal with it. You got to push through it. And that's not always the best method. Right. Right. You don't always like you have to push the kid off the deep end. That leads really well into one of the things that you say, a way that parents can make anxiety worse, which is avoiding risk. How, do you, how have you seen parents avoid risk that makes the anxiety worse in a kid? Right. Well, if you only stay in your comfort zone, always, you mm-hmm. will never learn new things. You'll never learn like, hey, I like that food or I like this activity because you would have never tried it, right? right? So as parents, we often take our kids like logic just at face value, like, oh, they don't like soccer. So I guess I will never make them play soccer. But then that would sound crazy if you said that in other areas, like, oh, my kid doesn't like vegetables. So I'm just never going to make them eat vegetables, which honestly, I see that in my practice too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Discomfort is part of life, yeah. right? Yeah, it is totally part of life. Yeah, like the whole like speaking in front of people. It's nerve wracking. It causes a lot of anxiety for some people, but you're not going to be able to get through life and never have to speak in front of people. That would be a very, very hard found life to to not have to face that. I have seen this happen in real time, the avoiding of risk and the repercussions of helping a child avoid risk where someone was 26 years old and refused to go on escalators. So it's, it's big. It's big when we avoid risk for our kids because then they never confront the things that are seemingly benign in society to overcome them and to get there, which leads me to the next way that parents can make anxiety worse is, and this one really hit me because I'm like, oh shoot, I think I do this. And I think we, are, we easily do this. It's the inconsistency, like telling child to face their fears one time and then to validate their emotions and not face their fears another time. And I read that and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, man. how do we even, how do we even like fix this, Regine? <laughs> Cause this is like all in us. This is like our like, oh, we just don't know what's best in the given moment. Right. And sometimes we even do it in the same moment, right? Sometimes you're like, no, no, it's okay. You know, all your fears are valid, but also, okay, but now it's time. You had enough lead up time. Now go do the thing, right? <laughs> like your fears were valid for five minutes, but now they're no longer valid. So like, let's, let's get a move on. Do this when you're ready. Yeah. But that has to be now. <laughs> that, I, it does. I, I, I'm laughing because I'm like, yeah, 100%. That would be me sometimes. Like, I'm like, I'm starting with the gentle of like, oh, I have to listen to and support support my my kid and this feeling that they're having and then like after a few minutes you're like oh wait a second I'm just making this worse <laughs> and then you're how do I back out of this slowly it's like that Homer Simpson gift like I'm just gonna walk <laughs> quietly back into the budget and pretend like this didn't happen <laughs> where's that reset button <laughs> right let me try this again 
but right. The good thing about parenting is you will have an opportunity to try it again because we have so many. Over and over again, the same situations come up. It's like Groundhog Day, but every day of your life. Parenting! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I look at it. The third way you say that parents make anxiety worse is accommodation. What does that right. mean? So that is the things that you do for your child's anxiety that you wouldn't do for, let's say, a sibling that didn't have the same anxiety, right? So your kid doesn't want to go to school and maybe your older kid is fine going to school. So you just, nope, you're going to school, going on the bus. But your middle one, when they say they don't want to go to school, you're like, oh, they can't handle them this. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drive them. Been guilty of that. (laughs) (laughs) You're going like, ah, crap. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So there's a, so then like, how do you get over that? Like if you, if you see that child who's like, oh my gosh, they're having such a freak out because they don't like their bus driver and it would just be easier in my morning to drive them, right? Like, we're easier that, my what's evening. the other approach? And that's why we accommodate our kids because it's easier in the moment. So you're not thinking about yeah. yourself next month where you are the chauffeur to and from school and it's ruining your life. You're thinking about yourself this morning that my kid yeah. has to get on the freaking bus. So get on the bus. <laughs> right? It's a fair point, right? There's a time and a place in parenting where we do need to think about what can get us through in the moment. But that's for your typical situation. This is where it's gotten bigger than that. Like where, again, like you're dealing with actual anxiety, not just the don't pet the tiger anxiety. Right, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's always a place yeah. for some accommodation. Like right? yeah. the, the word accommodation is like, okay, if the kid is struggling reading, you make the assignment easier so they can handle it, right? But you also need yeah. to have that method in place for how the kid's going to catch up. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. It's like in education, we call it the least restrictive environment where we give them the accommodation to succeed, but we don't accommodate them so much that they fall behind and fall behind their peers and fall behind social. Cause I could see like not getting on the bus, like you're missing a social skill there of dealing with a situation that you feel uncomfortable in. Like, what do you do? Your whole life will be not getting on that bus, which I've seen happen. <laughs> Right. (laughs) And I can't go into specifics, but (laughs) it is a good thing that you are bringing this message to parents because we definitely don't want to have our kids be 30 years old and not getting on buses and us driving them everywhere still. Right. Um, Right. Which can occur. So we've gone through three of the ways parents can make anxiety worse. We are going to hear your fourth way, which we actually really embrace here at No Guilt Mom and is part of like our whole mission. And we'll get to it right after the break. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. (laughs) Well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. So we've talked about how parents help their kids avoid risk. We've talked about how parents can be inconsistent and how they accommodate their children. This fourth way, I am totally aware of myself doing, and that's when we model our own anxieties for our kids and how we deal with our anxieties affects our kids as well. 
How have you seen that play out, Regine? Right. So I feel bad because I throw my husband under the, under the bus for this one all the time because my favorite example of this is my husband is afraid of spiders. And we have in Long Island, there are these jumping spider cricket oh, things God. in the basement. They're terrifying. <laughs> Breeze right there with your right. husband. <laughs> <Out of there. laughs> Those right. are my scariest things. They could be the size of like the top of a pin. I don't care. Right. And it no, jumps, and they I'm jump. out. Right. They <laughs> oh jump. Oh my God. Yeah. So, right. Like one of my kids is, is sitting in the basement and she sees one and she starts yelling. And my husband comes down and he starts yelling. And now I have two right. people freaking out and now she's just wanting to be afraid of the freaking spider. And to run, yeah. like, what's the answer here? Run and yell. That's the way we handle anxiety. We run and yell, right? Like, exactly. Yep. <laughs> and again, it's like, in my house, we don't do this. Sorry, turn back around, go back down and you're going to kill that bug. And you're going to try well, to do it without. It's okay to be anxious in front of your kids. But when you model the way you don't want them acting, they are learning the way you don't want them acting. Even if all the mm -hmm. words you say is right, when they have to do something hard, you are giving the inverse message of what you want, right? What's the big deal if you make a mistake? Everybody makes mistakes. And then you like, I don't know, screw up the measurements of something when you're baking and you're like, this is terrible. Now my dessert is ruined. Like <laughs> I ruined Thanksgiving or whatever because of my cake. That is not the message you want your kids to be saying, to be speaking. Sometimes, it's you, true. sometimes you're lucky. Like when, oh, I don't know, somebody here on the podcast might have dropped their pumpkin pie on the floor literally 20 minutes before we had to leave for Thanksgiving dinner, sobbing mess. And the kid walks up and goes, it's okay, mom, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, sometimes... Sometimes we do well and they show up well. Like, I, I, I'm I, curious about that, though. I have to throw this into my own personal experience. Sorry, a second experience. I am terrified of heights. Terrified. And I don't even know how it necessarily started. All I can tell you is that the epitome of it was when I went to the top of the Statue of Liberty, had a panic attack, and they had to bring the paramedics up to get me down. And nothing to be carried down on a stretcher down that tiny little, like, like little spiral staircase. That was a lot of fun. Anyways, her. That's so uh, terrifying. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So ever terrifying. since, like, I just, ugh, I have a hard time with heights. And I 100% can tell you my son's fear of heights is from my own reaction to that. But I do push myself and try to do things, especially around him, that I am terrified of. Like, you will see my legs shaking, but I'm doing it anyways. So I'm like, see, it's not that bad. I'm not dying. It's okay. Right. And my, my teenage son, though, is still like a hard nope. Uh -uh. Ain't no. going to do it. No way. No how. Right. So that, well, that can be hard. I would say that's also like sometimes the parenting is not enough, but it's almost okay. like the foundation that your kid is going to learn the skills based on that, based on saying, okay, mom pushed herself. I get that I have to, I'm not ready yet. Like my parenting is not enough right now. Maybe like, yeah. I don't know if he gets a job on the 50th floor of some building, then he's going to need therapy to work that <laughs> out. <laughs> I might have to bring that up to him. Like he, he wants to be a computer programmer and be like, Hey, the best jobs are at the top of the building. That's all I got to say. So I gotta say, <laughs> not always, but... <laughs> not always, but I think that's a great point because like, I've seen that in my kids. I have high anxiety. I know that I have modeled stuff for them that I do not want them to react that way. And it's like one of those things where I give myself self-compassion about it because it came out when I was in just a state of fear. Like a jumping spider. Yeah, like a jumping spider. <laughs> you can't be your kid's therapist. And even you as a therapist say this over and over again. I learned this from you, Regina, yeah. and I felt so much better. Like you're not a therapist to your kids and you do this for a living. So this idea of them needing extra help and therapy is something that I took to heart. And I mean, both of my kids are in therapy because I see the same anxiety that I have. And I took from you. I'm like, I can't do this alone. I need help. I need the help and guidance of a professional. Yeah. And so getting them in that therapy is a great and wonderful thing. And we've seen great results from it. Right. It's the best. Even if the therapist is saying exactly what you would say, it's so great yeah. for them to have someone that's not their mom say it. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that, 
that's the key right there. It can't be us. It, right. No matter how many times we do it, we're it, it's still it's somebody else said this, and it, you know what, mom? It's amazing. <laughs> And you're uh-huh. like, <laughs> <laughs> Another like, example of holding things in. <laughs> <They're> just, <laughs> not, not showing the behavior that you don't want them to have, right? Like, oh. Right. Well, also, I think the emotion part is important here, right? If we're going to go to yeah. back to that side of the triangle, the, one of the reasons why parents can't be their kid's therapist is because we have our own emotional reaction to what they're going through. So yeah. sometimes... Mm-hmm. We're going to have to be like, okay, like I am suffering with you and my suffering with you is going to make things worse for you. So I need to figure out a different way through. And sometimes it's recognizing that because I'm suffering with you, I'm not the one to give you the solution here. Right. Right. Yeah. We need to look for some outside help and even looking for additional help for yourself as an adult is a wonderful thing as well so that you can process your own things and learn how to deal with them better and not cause yourself so much pain. Right. Oh, because that's important. A lot no of what pain this for came you. out of was because I was working with so many parents, right? Right. It's like oh the line God, yeah. between like, how do I parent my anxious kid and how do I figure out what's good for me is not such a distinct line. It's hard to tell where you no, are sometimes. it's not. So your book comes out today, Regine, Parenting Anxious Kids, Understanding Anxiety in Children by Age and Stage. We talked a lot about in what's in the front of the book in part one in this episode right here, but we didn't even delve into your part two. Can you tell them what they get in that part two where it's like broken apart? Right. So what I really wanted was a book that could grow with your child, with, I guess, mm-hmm. with you as a parent. So I broke it up by ages and stages. So if you have a toddler, like what should you be on the lookout for? What should you do to kind of prevent anxiety if possible? Love that. And then as kids grow, what skills do you as a parent need to support them as they kind of become more independent? Because we know that that's what happens, right? Middle schoolers need different things from their parents than teenagers who need different things than emerging adults who still need parenting right? Just because you hit 18 doesn't mean you're like, well, you're an adult now, so you don't need anything. I'm all done here. Bye. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's more like scaffolding your kids to help parents know what skills you should be focusing on as your kid grows. I love it. And a toddler through high school or an adult, like it's for every parent. That's fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us again on the podcast. It has been amazing. And I am, of course, going to take all of this knowledge and skills that you have and try to apply it to my own parenting in some new way that I'll be able to talk to you about next time that we have you on the podcast. <laughs> that sounds Yes, because we have to have you be a three-timer. Yes. I got to come, <laughs> come with a better title than there that. There are always new books. It's like the trilogy. Right. That, that's like, it's a trilogy. actually what my husband was like. Yeah. You need to go for the trilogy. I'm like, is that a thing in nonfiction? I don't think we go for trilogies, but you know. It certainly yeah. can be. <laughs> <laughs> got to go for it. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I saw you smiling during this interview, Brie, at so many things that Regine mentioned. And you're like, oh. Oh, yeah, I I have. And, you know, we sat on after the interview was done for like an almost another like 20, 25 minutes just talking about all the stuff that we have in our own personal lives that we can't always share online or on the podcast or keeping privacy for our, our own families. But I mean, there was so much. And yeah, there was just so much on there that I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And I absolutely love her book especially the way that it's set up. It's like an easy user manual for parenting in it this is. day and age. It is. Well, the her whole thing about modeling our own anxieties, I'm always so aware of with my own kids. Like, because my husband, he just went, you know, to Singapore and India. Mm-hmm. And you went through this anxiety with me because I was texting you instead of putting it on my children where uh, he was on 15 hours ahead of us. Mm-hmm. So it was never a good time to chat. Like 15 hours when it was like 6 p.m. here, it was like 9 p.m. at night there. And so I texted him when we got home from something and he didn't respond and he didn't respond. and. I was like, okay, well, it's nighttime. Mm -hmm. I just woke up. I bet he fell asleep. I bet he fell asleep while watching YouTube videos. I bet that's what happened. And I was texting you, Brie. And like here at home, I'm like trying not to show it to my kids. And I was just like, yeah, like, I wonder why dad hasn't responded. 
and I'm telling them the logical part of my brain. I bet he fell asleep. But inside, I'm like, oh, my gosh, he like had a heart attack in the hotel room and he's waiting there. And I should really call somebody so that they go check on him to make sure he doesn't have a heart attack. And maybe I should call his phone like this is my voice going on inside of me that I was really, really tamping down with logical brain. Well, you know what? And I would say you are not alone in that. Like, did you ever watch the show? This is us. And yeah. it right and how like I forget which which character it was because I only watched like part of that show. But there is the uh the brother, the adopted brother, him and his wife would like when they had really stressful things, they'd be like, Okay, worst case scenario, and they just start dumping oh, all the terrible things. And I remember watching that on that show and being like, Oh my god, other people have that thought process. It's not just me with this whole like doom thought process. So sometimes I'll I'll unload that to my husband and he'll be like, Whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> I feel like I've been ruined by some TV shows because, you know, great drama, those unexpected things happen. And Uh, I was a big fan of TV shows. And so when you watch TV shows and you're not, don't have that much experience in real life, what actually happens, you start believing the TV show experiences are real. And that's what happens. Oh, like lost planes break apart in turbulence. That's what happens. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Mine is just like, I need to, I need to get it out so it doesn't keep running circles around in my brain like literally the crazy thoughts just keep going around and around and around I'm like okay I need to I need to empty them out so that I can have somebody else look at me and like when because like you said when you were texting me you were like I know that this is very unlikely that this scenario is what's happening but my fear is afraid that it's it's xyz and you would talk to me and you were able to talk through the steps and that's the thing that helps with the anxiety that we, those are some of those skills that Regine talks about, like that we can help our kids by being like, all right, I know I have this fear. I know my heart is racing. I can breathe. I can do these other things and logically X, Y, and Z. And so your plan was, right? I'll keep myself busy until X, Y, Z time. And if he doesn't text me back by X, Y, Z time, then I'll figure out a plan B. (laughs) And it worked. Yeah. Right. There was a text. And it worked. He did text me back. Yeah. He was like, on my way to the airport. I'm like, great. I wasn't worried at all. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, it (laughs) is. I mean, we live in a day and age now where anxiety is much more rampant. The world is connected in a completely different place. The rules and the expectations and or the strategies that were popular back when we were kids in the 70s, 80s, 90s don't apply here. Or they can, but they're not going to they're not going to be as successful because we live in a different time. Ignoring the huge pandemic from a couple of years ago and the impact yeah. that has had. But we can't keep acting like we don't have our own mental health issues that we're working through, our anxiety, our depression. We can't pretend like it's not there and expect it just to go away. Pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is not, it, I have yet to see a single, single mental health like publication and or therapist that's like, oh, well, just suck it up and you'll be fine. No. Yeah. No. That's not no, how that'll this, never happen. That's not how this works. That's it's how you not. become traumatized. <laughs> yep. Stunted. The emotions will always come out in another way. Yeah. Always. Always like you have to work through emotions. You cannot push them aside or stuff them down. And that's something like I have learned. Yeah. So, so, and improved on throughout this podcast and through everyone that we talk to, um, knowing that you have to share your feelings in a way that's, you know, good for you and doesn't hurt others. Yeah. uh, But yeah, going from there. Well, so if you, I was going to say, so if people really liked this episode with Regine, like you mentioned, she is a two-timer here on the No Guilt Mom podcast. Check out her first episode we had, episode 125, helping our kids manage their worries and anxiety. So that Mm -hmm. was a fantastic episode with Regine. It's actually one of our highest rated episodes. So lots of pristine, great information in there. And if you loved this episode, go grab her book. It's fantastic. And it is like, Again, I love the way that that she put it together, how you talked about part one and part two. It's a mm-hmm. very easy to read, easy to digest, easy to implement, easy to understand support. I think that's going to yes. be like a new a, a new present I give to like all my <laughs> all my friends that have kids. Here. You're like, here you go. Here you go. <laughs> I'm not saying your kid is anxious. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying that you're going to probably 
thank me for this book at some point in time. It's a good one. Yes. Parenting Anxious Kids came out today. There's a link to purchase it in the show notes. So remember, the best mom is a happy mom. Take care of you. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for stopping by. Are you looking for something to listen to with your whole family? Then check out Six Minutes, produced and created by Gen Z Media. With over 200 twisty, cliffhanger-filled episodes, Six Minutes tells the story of 11-year-old Holiday who is pulled from the icy waters with no memory of who she is or where she came from. Three years ago, Brindley Pasternak helped the Anders family uncover the truth about Holiday's past. Now she'll need them to help her find the truth about hers. In Six Minutes Out of Time, the long-awaited sequel, Cyrus Anders is found unconscious near the mysterious Elixir Academy in Florida, and Brindley learns the school may have a shocking connection to her missing mother. Dive in now and get the most downloaded family audio adventure in history. Follow Six Minutes wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free with the GZM family subscription.